I was born on the 10th of September 1913 uh, in, near the town of Friede in the Free State, which lies uh, almost on the border between uh, uh, the Free State and the Transvaal, and is actually near what we call Standard Town. Uh, but uh, my parents uh, were living near, were born and in fact living near Harry Smith, and uh, I was lucky or my, because both, or my family was lucky, because, in fact I can say I was lucky, because both my paternal and my maternal uh, Par I mean, grandparents were well-to-do people. Well, I'm so that now I can say that I do not come from a poor surrounding or poor families. Now, they were so well-to-do that because they were both farmers and also traders. Both. When I say farmers now, they had large herd of cattle and flock of sheep, and then they used to... Uh, farm, especially produce large quantities of wheat. They were traders because now they were engaged also in transport business. Now at that time, I mean, when they were still young, I mean, they used to transport goods from the coast, for instance, from Durban to the mining centers like Kimberley. And then my father then was the man, I mean, was uh, in charge of that trade so that he was the one who was driving the span of his father to carry out this business. And uh, so they became quite well to do. This went on well until, of course, after the Boer War more or less, or just before or during the Boer War, because now then they developed a large number of poor whites surrounding that area, and then they became envious of the wealth of the, our parents, I mean our grandparents. But I must point out that now it was not only our, my grandparents, but black people, our Africans, around that area, you know, we were fairly well-to-do and independent. Now, then they started complaining about them, and then, of course, organizing, and then the government's tent on our people, and then they caused them now to leave the area. Now, that was the beginning of their being underdeveloped. If you can imagine now, people who had such large flock uh, of sheep and big head of cattle, you know, and, you know, and that trading uh, business, you see, when they were uprooted, you see, it's, it was the beginning now, it was the beginning uh, uh, of their impoverishment. Now, by the time they reached uh, the place where I was born, much of their wealth had been depleted. Now, then at about that time, you see, uh, especially when I was born, it was now after uh, the British uh, government had conquered the entire Azania, or if I'm, am I to use its colonial name, South Africa. And then uh, that is everybody there, including the, and that is now the Dutch or the Boer uh, imperialists or colonialists, that of the Free State and the Transvaal, fell under the colonialism and imperialism of England. We had Milner now then, who was trying now to coordinate all this. Uh, now, as our parents, grandparents, now lost, you know, the, the farming rights, now uh, 
that is now uh, after, especially after uh, the union was formed, with that union which brought about the joint imperialism of the British and the Dutch, then they decided that now they should acquire land themselves. And then fortunately, at about around about that time, we had uh, in uh, Azania a young lawyer who was trained in, both in America and in England, and uh, Presley, in the name, name of Presley, Gassame. And then he organized land syndicate, and then our par grandparents, my grandparents, both ways, that is paternal and maternal grandparents, bought land in Dakar. That is where I grew up. That is where I attended primary school until I passed standard five, when I went to Natal, where I studied now. Uh, I mean, I, I, I attended school under a mission, Anglican mission school, which was called St. Chet's. But now I was in the primary school, which was called St. Beats. But the boarding school was the same. We just mixed those with training for teacher training and other students. Now, so now I did, I've completed my primary education at St. Beats, at St. Chad's, where later on, then after I passed in Standard 6, I, my, I went to St. Peter's, Rosettenville, where I did my high school, that is from Form 1 to Form 5. And then from there, uh, well, after a short, in fact, a year break, I went to Adams College where I did my teacher training, and then, which was a, a post metric course which offered, you know, teaching, I mean, that is now teacher training uh, plus three uh, degree courses. And now, that was my early education. Uh, now you can see that now the background. Now, uh, the background now I grew in Dakar, you see, this, that I think I should mention besides schooling, because that area became very small for the wealth of, our, of my grandparents. And actually, as I grew older, I saw their wealth, you know, being depleted, even their cattle dying and their sheep dying one by one, you see. So now, actually now, I saw the process of underdevelopment so that economically, I am 100% animal of underdevelopment, you see. Uh, uh, the, the very fact that now, well, of course, uh, 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 I, you know, I never worked for a white man. I mean, in that sense, you see, in spite of it all, you know, um, they, were managed, they managed to educate me and to resuscitate us. Even during the Depression, you know, we, le we, we lived better life than many uh, people there, including uh, the, the so-called white farmers there. In fact, my home was a sort of uh, a place where many people came to get food. You see, because of the, our plots there. Well, I met my wife, uh, I mean, uh, personally first, uh, at St. Peter's, where she had come with the school children um, to play against, I mean, uh, I mean to play uh, hockey against our school. So that is where I first met her personally. But, uh, well, my wife was a, was a, a woman or a girl who was very popular in the Western Township and Sophia Town. Then at St. Peter's, I had very many young St. Peterian, I mean people, students from Sophia Town and Western Native Township. So they used to talk um, a lot about her, you see. And then because she was a sports girl, 
musician, even uh, in class she was not bad. She was an all-rounder uh, and then also a good debater. But I also heard that she was in a, in a choir. That's yes, that's what I'm saying, musician. Uh, that's why I said musician. Now, well, uh, at that time, we a school choir and all that, you know. The choir then comes much later. I mean, that, that what I mean is that when I first met her. But now I made even stronger acquaintance as we were now, um, as we met in debates, especially uh, in, uh, in at, uh, well, at the University of uh, uh, the Witwatersrand. The, 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 there was what was called Sigma Club, which used to organize debates. So now, I used to lead a team from St. Peter's, and she was in a team which came from the university itself. So now, we actually met there in debates. So that's how now I actually been made further a strong acquaintance with her. And then, of course, after qualifying as a teacher, well, we taught at the same place that is in Orlando East, and then we were doing exactly the same thing. She was conducting a choir at St. Mary's, which was uh, one of the, in fact, it was the best choir in Orlando because it won every year competition in the primary school. And then I might mind mention now that now it cost a lot of uh, 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 well, what can I say? I'm misunderstood or even a bit of jealousy among the male teachers there because she was the first woman to conduct, you know, choir, senior choir. And they felt that now St. Mary's had no business to ignore male teachers and put up a woman there uh, to conduct it. Well, I was at Orlando High School then I was uh, conducting the senior choir of Orlando High School. Well, uh, well, I, well, I cannot say much because I was doing, but it was uh, one of the choirs which also won many competitions too. So we were doing the same things too with my wife. We've always done the same thing. Of course, ever since now, her life really has been music. She has been in many choirs, well, the, among which now was the Ionian Choir, which was conducted by me. Goma, and then now above all now she's running her own uh, children's choir, which is the Nightingale, and then she's very much interested in the children's choir, and then she is also a, a writer, and, in, and she writes mainly in poetry, much of it has been in vernacular, so that is the type of a wife I have. <laughs> Newsleak was founded at the request of Dr. Toma as the chairman of ANC. And then the first person he asked to do so, to help him, was Peter Rabrocco. Because Peter Rabrocco at the time was running one of the largest, in fact it was the largest student organization, the Johannesburg Student Organization. By the way, my wife was the treasurer of that organization. Now, uh, but later on, of course, there were, uh, came in Mandela, Sisulu, and Tambo. Now, uh, Peter Mda and uh, uh, Lambete, uh, we, we can say now they were the theoretician, not necessarily the founders of the Youth League, you see. Now, uh, Mdao was teaching at the Roman Catholic School uh, in Orlando East. Uh, and then uh, uh, Lembete joined in much later when he had come now for his articleship for becoming a lawyer under Dr. Pikai Seme. But now Lembete is the one who gave it now when he was at uh, elected, that is now the president of the Youth League, he is the one who gave it now uh, its uh, uh, policies, philosophy, and ideas. And they worked closely together with Mda at that time. And they issued a lot, 
I mean, great deal of literature. And so they, they left uh, their mark uh, on the organization. So most of the ideas uh, of the organization emanated from their joint contribution. The ideas now on the top of the Youth League now was that now well, uh, to discard questions of collaboration with the uh, with the rulers, to abandon the program of uh, petitions. Remember, our forefathers now believed that now they could petition and use sound uh, argument, and that now their position, the white men would uh, regard them now as civilized. You see, at that time, I might point out that way that now, the Africans believed that now, well, if they could be educated and be civilized as a white man, then there would have been no objection. They would now be entitled to get the franchise, which was a really a wrong concept to say that. And then, of course, they rejected the leadership of uh, the ruling class, especially the, the liberal class, and they encouraged African nationalism. Most importantly, of course, of all of these other things, was that now, uh, that is now the leadership of ANC at that time had abandoned the program of action, that is, of 1948. And that now was a grievous, uh, uh, what if I might use the Christian name, uh, word seen against the sensitivity of the Youth League, because that program was the program which was hashed out by the Youth League. So if you went against that program, it meant therefore uh, you challenge them. It was a red flag, you know, placing before a, a bull, and then it, it brought the matter to a, uh, to a close. You see. And so that was the most important uh, reason for the uh, Youth League or PAC to be founded. Now, there is this question of the Freedom Charter. I'm not going to elaborate on its history, but now it came as a result of Dr. Matthews. He is the man who uh, suggests a uh, Freedom Charter of some kind. But instead, uh, we had this document now, Freedom Charter, which was not known to the person who drew it up and where it came from. And then the ideas too, well, <laughs> were, uh, uh, in fact, were, were f fickle, if I might put it that way. They were, they were weak, I mean, they, they were not clear. When they talked of, you no know, the country, the, the land belonging, I mean, South Africa belonging to all and so on, and all that thing, which was against, of course, the ideas of the youth leakers, because they knew that you know, South Africa was a colony, and uh, the, a colony which belonged to the indigenous people. And then uh, they talked also of multiracialism. Now, we do not, and we did not, and we still do not believe in racism. We believe in uh, one race, the human race. So we rejected that idea. But they continued to talk of multiracialism. And then, of course, the Freedom Charter, if you read it, it expresses that idea of multiracialism. Even today, I may say that now, some people talk of non-racialism, but if you study the way closely, what they mean is just that now, to use the word non-racialism, you uh, know, but now to cover multiracialism. It is now multiracialism in a new code, attractive code. Because their ideas now is that of consociationism, which still means white domination. Well, the way we ended, of course, 
that it was a question of why we broke away from ANC. Then we said that the straw that broke the Cummins back was the the breaking of the conditions of the program of action of 1948. Now, our first uh, campaign was the status campaign, as you say so, which came earlier, from 1959. Now, this status campaign was now to bring or to make people now have confidence in themselves and discard uh, the, the fear of the ruling class. And then that was the first campaign. And then I must say now, this status campaign uh, is always continuing because it has to do with the uh, educating of the mind and making people conscious of themselves. The status campaign was introduced by the president, by our late president, Robert Soboko, who explained, uh, explained it clearly what it was meant for. He actually meant what I've actually told you that now. It was to make people gain confidence in themselves so that now they could produce strategies and programs which they themselves will carry out independently. Then, of course, after status campaign, there came the, the, the first important campaign of PEC, that is now the past campaign of 1960, of March the 21st, 1960. Now, that past campaign, of course, was directed mainly you know, to get rid of the notorious past laws which were harassing our people, which the enemy was using it now uh, to divide and to make people uh, uh, or to create fear among the people. And then uh, that past campaign, therefore, its first uh, aim was now to remove the fear of prison from among the people because uh, the oppressors used prisons, you know, uh, to keep down the people. But now if people now could now offer themselves freely and go to prison, they would conquer that fear. And then, uh, as the president said now, it was going to be a non-violent campaign. And uh, well, of course, he made a long statement on non-violence. And in fact, he called upon his followers to observe strict non-violent measures. But unfortunately, as we all now know, uh, that day, uh, because of so many people who responded to the call of the PAC against the past laws, uh, uh, people were massacred at uh, Sharpville on that date, leaving about 69 people dead and many scores wounded. Now, this was in spite of the fact that these people were unarmed and were just staging a peaceful demonstration about, against past laws. And the, the idea of the campaign was that now they should offer themselves to police stations, nearest police stations for arrest and leave their passes at home, but not to destroy them, but just leave them behind because it was a mental, it was calculated now to be uh, mental, to free them mentally. Because even destroying that document, if you have not, you had not discarded, you see, the mental respect for it, 
it would, it would be meaningless. So that now you leave the document at home because it meant nothing. So <laughs> I'm making this point now because some people started talking, they talk of banning uh, passes. That was not the campaign. The leadership, of course, of PAC felt bitter about after Shavit because now they had uh, in good faith undertaken their campaign to be conducted under uh, non-violent conditions. And then when their following were massacred in that fashion, they were convinced that now non-violence now had no place in Azania. That was the first thing. Secondly, the banning of PAC meant very little to, the, to us because we, we realized that now if they could react in that major, I mean, for innocent people, against innocent people, well, banning we was not going to stop us from continuing with our struggle. And then, as a result, of course, we were thereafter able to raise one of the greatest guerrilla army. Now, it, remember, it was not only burning, there was also uh, the state of emergency for the first time. And many people were arrested and detained without trial for the first time in our country. Uh, you see that now? And also the passes were suspended for a short while anyway to try to appease the members of PEC and the African people. And there was a great flight of capital, especially the British capital, because it was the one which was dominating in Azania at that time. For the first time now, the white people realized that now they were not so almighty. And it also brought this among the Africans that now uh, it was, I mean, the possibility of defeating the white regime. Now, PAC now formed one of the largest, and in fact, I think it is the largest so far, internally, even externally, that ever existed in Azania. But that one was 100% internal. That is uh, PAC uh, guerrilla, which was called Poco. Poco, you see, that, well, I suppose many people want to know what does that mean, Poco, you know, uh, it comes from uh, the youth league members who used to call themselves that Dingum Africa Poco, which means that now I'm a pure African. Now that Poco means pure. So that now people, now they adopted that name Poco and gave it to the guerrilla at that time, guerrilla army at that time. And then this guerrilla uh, army uh, that is engaged in you know, the government you now, yeah, uh, forces, that is the army and the police at various theaters, Kamatak and Bashi, Queenstown, uh, and many other areas, you know, and that is part, you know, uh, and uh, the results there, well, of course, with that now, uh, there was great panic among the whites at that time. And uh, also to such an extent that now the government was forced to call a commission. And then that commission was conducted by Judge Sneeman, which recommended, you know, all these bad laws, so that now all these laws that we have today flow from that commission of Sneeman. In the 60s, we had the pass law. Do you see that? Mm. This time now, we had this grievance which we could easily exploit. Do you see what it meant? Mm. You see? Which was a popular among the people. Now, it is not an accident that that 
synchronized with the uh, uh, first now Apla. Previously we had Kopoko. Yes. Apple is now action in, in Guavuma. Remember now, Apple is action in Guavuma 1975, where we were training now, uh, we trained internally, guerrillas. Now, no longer now the Panga ones, I mean, we're using spears, and, not spears, I mean, you know, homemade weapons. But now these now, we guerrillas now, who are being trained internally now by our guerrillas now who came from overseas. And then that student in our organ action now coincided, you know, synchronized with now the first action, internal action of APLA. Well, I suppose many people will say it's an, it was a, a coincidence. When we leave it at that, to see. <coughs> so that now, and then of course, it's a well known history now that well, we were the only party, or except the black consciousness, who were charged and uh, sentenced for the uprising of 1976. You know, <laughs> some of us, you know, because we're involved there, you know, we, we, don't, we don't even like, we enjoy talking about that incident because it wasn't a, a pleasant incident to start with. Where we were faced now, not only with the police against us, but the judge himself. You know, was obviously on the side of the police. And then uh, there it was absolutely made secret so that now the judge and the police, you know, used to do certain things which in open court could not be done because they would be challenged. What kind of things? You know, I mean, uh, uh, things like... Uh, uh, you know, telling the, what the police should do, you see, leading evidence in favor of the police. You see that the judge now cross-examining in such a manner that, you see, the witness must, showing, showing that now he wants the witness to answer in a definite, certain manner. Mm. But didn't they have an, an, uh, another motive, like giving no uh, uh, publicity to the people? Yeah, well, of course. That, I mean, that is now insight. You know, of course, the, mo the motive, of course, was that, you see, again, you know, not to give PAC, well, uh, because we're the only political party, and it was going to be patent that now, you see, that case actually disclosed that now the culprits, the people who brought about uh, that is the, the 1976 uprising was PAC. And yet it suited the liberals to say that it was a spontaneous action of the students, as it suited them in 1960 to say that now it was just the masses in Azania who just rose against the past laws. As a result of all this, bad treatment in prison. You see, some people died because of diseases of, out of you know, malnutrition and so on. Uh, now, later on, of course, uh, some of us now we were sick as we are, and even, you know, uh, we, you know found ourselves now having uh, TB, and which we are surprised that it was not detected until recently when I was outside. And then, of course, I had uh, this tumor. I did not even know that I had that tumor when it was discovered now recently when I was in Johannesburg prison because I didn't feel any pain. The only thing, sign which I had, I, I was really, it was a question of obesity that had become too fat. My body was very, very uh, fat. You know, big now. But now I was glad that now uh, people in Johannesburg discovered it, and then of course it was removed by operation. Uh, but now, still, I I was not. I did not feel well uh, until I had to, to ask that now we should have further uh, treatment. 
first of all, is that uh, the, there is progressive forces in the international uh, world should support the struggle of the oppressed. And they must be seen to, to do so. In the first place, they must do it as one. You see, their duty is to encourage those who are engaged in the actual struggle internally uh, to fight their struggle insofar as they are concerned together. So they should avoid tendencies which can uh, help to divide the struggling masses, for instance, in Azania. And it is not the duty of the international community to decide the form and nature of the struggle in Azania. That is the task of the Azanian people. Equally, it is not the right or duty of the people or, or uh, however friendly they may be to decide who ultimately will win that struggle. And it would be naive to think that in a big country like the Azania there will only be one party or one group which will fight for the liberation of that country. Otherwise it would mean therefore that now we are contradicting ourselves. We are admitting here that insofar as the struggle is concerned, then there should be totalitarianism. Only one party, one person and what not. You see, no longer democrat democratic thinking and, and no free thinking of how the struggle can be best won. People can't see uh, the problem from the same point of view. So it is false for anybody to claim to himself the right to know who is now the correct one. Now, so this sectionalism, especially when it comes from those who think are assisting uh, the struggle, is abhorrent and it should be discouraged by all means. Now, I would come to the positive side. Uh, with the struggle requires me things. First of all, it requires moral support, which many countries and many progressive forces have been doing. It requires material support, financially and otherwise. Well, some, many groups have really donated and put uh, uh, their hands into, the, into their pockets to assist the struggle. But unfortunately, this aid somewhere has been abused because there have been tendencies which have come about now that now this aid now is uh, controlled by certain sections, especially those sections which believe uh, that they can interfere directly into the affairs of the struggling masses. But uh, the ordinary man in the street in Europe and in Asia has done his best to assist the liberation movement by collecting the money. But that, uh, I'm afraid, has been abused sometimes by the very uh, liberation movement. Finally, now, I would say, we go beyond material interest. The struggle sometimes requires you as individual. You know, uh, sometimes we expect that uh, some people somewhere will be with us. That is now uh, when the very uh, fact that you have to give yourself into the struggle. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Now, because Azania requires that. So we are saying, especially to the Africans in diaspora that come forward, 
it is your battle or it is your liberation struggle, come forward, come be with us. And we don't only need you now, but we need you afterwards because you have got the skills. Now we say into the, um, in the, um, to the progressive forces, come be with us. We need you now and we'll need you during the period of reconstruction. Thank you. Yes. Now yes. I think now, well, I will put it now in the words of our late president, Robert Sobukwe, that now we are fighting for life and life in abundance. Which means, first of all, we want people to live, increase, and be many. Secondly, that now they must be well provided for. That is now all the resources in the land must benefit the people of Azania. And then, as that is economically, culturally, they must now have the opportunity of improving themselves culturally. That is now developing their, first of all, uh, uh, customary or innate culture of the country, indigenous culture, and then enriching it with the contact of the culture of humanity as a whole. Economically, then, we are going to have a, a socialist order. By socialist order, now we mean socialism in its true sense, where there will be equitable distribution of wealth. And we believe that this can only be attained if it is guaranteed and its custodians are the people who believe in it. That is why we say now, even after the liberation, workers and peasants will be in the vanguard to uh, see that now uh, freedom is consolidated and that true socialism is established based on the material condition of Azania. To talk of whether it will be like that of Russia or China would be a falsity because uh, those countries did not develop their socialism from a vacuum. It, it evolved from the uh, material conditions which existed in Russia in 1917 and which has existed in China in 1949, is it 49? Yes, so that now, even in Azania, we will have a, a socialism. I mean, socialism now, in the true sense, still remains that as propounded by Karl Marx. See that? But now it depends on different conditions, how it will emerge and be applicable. And socialism, again, does not necessarily that now. It must result in bureaucracy or totalitarianism, you see. And uh, I'm glad that now our late uh, president foresaw that as early as 1959 when we established PAC, and how true it is today that even people like Gorbachev and people in China have recognized that now uh, you cannot ignore the developments and the improvements and uh, the, the, the entire uh, human enrichment which capitalism per se has brought into the world. It is a system which has been brought by people. So it can't be absolutely be uh, bankrupt of good things. But today, they are the ones now who are doing exactly what our president said. He said, we shall borrow from the East and the West, and we shall take the best and develop our own social order.